I was gonna do this video with a glass of wine, but I finished the wine before I started and now I just have a glass of water. Yay. Hello, angels. I care deeply about the well being of the trans community. And when we speak about things like mental health, individual success, and access to an equitable supply of basic human rights, I feel it necessary to have tough conversations about trans identities and how our lives are politicized by the masses and how public opinion on trans lives can be harmful. We know the trans community is subject to violence, inequity, and toxic language, which has a collective effect effect on our mental health. Trans folks feel the weight of bigotry. We feel it in our workspaces, we feel it in our, our families, and we feel it in public settings, including Cyberland. For trans folks, like many marginalized identities, our personal can often be political. I'm stealing this phrase, of course, from second wave feminism to say that public health realities of the trans community is unfairly wrapped up in the general population's public opinion about us. But what informs the general public? What did they hear or read that informs them about trans lives? And why do so many of them come to conclusions about our lives that are vastly misinformed? That's what I want to discuss today the effects toxic language and misinformed media has on trans lives. Before I begin, my name is Samantha, they, them, she, her, and it's my goal to affirm trans femmes and along the way, help a few other people out as well. Consider subscribing if you enjoy media commentary, makeup and skincare, and all things trans related. In the media scape, a lot of misinformation is shared. We see this when folks confuse gender with sex or when they wrap up sexuality and gender identity. Today, I want to discuss how many people understand the experience of trans folks as dependent upon the medical world, particularly diagnoses. Yes, today we will be tackling trans medicalism. There is a very dominant argument in the media that questions, do you need gender dysphoria to be trans? For an alarming amount of cis folks and even to select binary trans folks, the answer is a resounding yes. I disagree. How I would like to approach this question is through objective reasoning. So of course we must establish a shared language by defining terms. So let's use the most popular method of research, which includes typing gender dysphoria into Google and um, that's it. No need for a degree in gender studies. We've got Google. I'm joking about this, but this is actually an important thing to note. A lot of people when looking for accurate information will start and end their search with Google. Google pulls definitions from the Oxford Dictionary. For many definitions that are limited in scope, the Oxford Dictionary can be a fantastic resource. But when searching for information regarding medical terminology, psychological phenomena, and anything that calls for complexity, this dictionary and Google will not suffice. In order for a reader to trust a definition or summation of a phenomena, it is critical that the ethos, meaning the credibility of the writer, gets a lot of attention. So instead of Google, a more credible source may be the American Psychiatric Association or the National Institutes of Health. Both are resources trusted by professionals all across the nation and beyond. This first citation is from the American Psychiatric Association, which cites the DSM-5. This document notes a few important facts that will help us unpack what gender dysphoria is and how it relates to trans identity. First, it notes that gender nonconformity is not in itself a mental disorder. Great! And that while diagnostic terms facilitate clinical care and access to insurance coverage, these terms have a stigmatizing effect. This is important to note because it situates dysphoria in an oppressive history that recognizes that gender minorities were once stigmatized unjustly to an extreme degree, and those effects still persist today. This is similar to how sexual minorities like gay men and women were deemed mentally ill and subject to incredibly dangerous and life-threatening procedures such as lobotomy or electric shock therapy. Gay and trans folks alike share a history of involuntary medical procedures in the name of research. In the age of Nazism, trans and gay folks were experimented on and their humanity was disregarded. We could easily call this torturous. The stigma referred to in the DSM is in relation with these and many more histories. 
Before more clinical approach to dysphoria, the DSM-5 states, for a person to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria, there must be a marked difference between the individual's expressed or experienced gender and the gender others would assign them. It also states, gender dysphoria is manifested in a variety of ways, including strong desires to be treated as the other gender or to be rid of one's sex characteristics, or even a strong conviction that one has feelings and reactions typical of the other gender. It is important to note that it isn't saying gender dysphoria is a strong desire to be treated as a gender not assigned to us, but rather that it can manifest in this way along with other ways. But the thing to keep in mind is that dysphoria is in direct relation to a personal feeling of disconnect with the gender assigned to us at birth. Let's try out another citation from the American Psychiatric Association where the headline reads, what is gender dysphoria? This text reads, gender dysphoria involves a conflict between a person's physical or assigned gender and the gender in which he, she, or they identify. People with gender dysphoria may be very uncomfortable with the gender they were assigned, sometimes described as being uncomfortable with their body, or uncomfortable with the expected roles of their assigned gender. So this definition adds a bit more. For starters, it recognizes non-binary and gender non-conforming identities as folks who may experience dysphoria. And I say that word may with emphasis because it doesn't say it does or it will, it says may, which suggests that it also may not. In reference to diversity, the text reads, the gender conflict affects people in different ways. And this is an absolute. There is no one way to experience dysphoria. For some folks, it can be debilitating. For others, it can be so minor that they do not claim to have dysphoria at all. In fact, the text says that we even have different responses to dysphoria. Some folks may engage in cross-dressing, some may want to socially transition, and some may want to medically transition. All or some of these options can be enough to address some folks' dysphoria or discomfort in their gender expression as it relates to their assigned sex. This next quote will directly address a misconception that non-binary identities and dysphoria need to go hand in hand or else they aren't trans, which gives wind to really catchy words like trans trender. The text reads, gender dysphoria is not the same as gender nonconformity, which refers to behaviors not matching the gender norms or stereotypes of the gender assigned at birth. Examples of gender nonconformity include girls behaving and dressing in ways more socially expected of boys or occasional cross-dressing in adult men. Let's keep in mind that what this text just said is that the expansion of gender expression is not limited to those who experience dysphoria. In her words, someone can express gender in a diverse number of ways that opposes gender norms, and yet they do not have to be diagnosed with dysphoria. One more tiny note here is that we got through two science-based articles and not a single time was the term transgender ever mentioned. Now this leads me to believe that there's a difference between what trans means and what the realities of dysphoria means in the medical world. Let's explore this by hearing a counter argument. In a recent YouTube publication, <laughs> a binary trans woman often given the label trans medicalist says, The idea that there is scientific validity to being transgender completely destroys the argument of self-identification. Let's rephrase this so it makes an argument in the given context. In my words, what the YouTuber is saying is that dysphoria is recognized in the medical industry and because it is in direct association with folks who identify as transgender, this must mean that one does not self-identify as transgender, but rather a doctor diagnoses someone with gender dysphoria and therefore diagnoses someone as transgender. Essentially, the individual has little to say if they are trans, but rather it is their body and how a doctor diagnoses their body that determines their trans identity. An enormous amount of people have been fed this mis information. Remember when the APA said that the medical terminology and how trans folks have been treated historically has brewed a widely accepted stigma? This is what the APA is referring to. The reality is that there 
are a huge differences between one's medical and psychological realities and then their trans identity. And although they are in direct relation with one another, the two terms are different. That's why they are two different terms. But that distinction alone isn't enough for a solid argument. So let's explore what transgender means separate from dysphoria. The APA has plenty of literature on transgender realities. There's a document called APA Resolution on Transgender Gender Identity and Expression Non-Discrimination that discusses the impact society has had on transgender, gender variant, and gender non-conforming individuals. Why am I doing this by my mouth? It cites that the trans community is subject to discrimination, inequity, and violence. It cites that the trans community is often subject to homelessness, unemployment, and increased levels of harassment in spaces such as institutions and workspaces. It cites that trans people are subject to sexual assault at alarming rates, suffer judicial injustice, and are often denied health care. What it does not say is that trans people need dysphoria. In fact, dysphoria is never addressed because there is a significant difference in the medical understanding of gender variance and the social construct of trans identities. But taking a couple of articles and saying, hey, this one says dysphoria when speaking about medical terms, and this one says trans when speaking about social terms, probably isn't enough to convince you that the relationship isn't mandatory. So let's look for articles that unpack whether or not one needs dysphoria to identify as trans. Let's start with the National Center for Transgender Equality, which writes this lovely concise nugget of text. For some transgender people, the difference between the gender they are thought to be at birth and the gender they know themselves to be can lead to serious emotional distress that affects their health and everyday lives if not addressed. Gender dysphoria is the medical diagnosis for someone who experienced this distress. A fantastic and clear indication that the two terms, trans and dysphoria, have different meanings and appropriately exist in two different contexts. Let's keep going. Not all transgender people have gender dysphoria. On its own, being transgender is not considered a medical condition. Many transgender people do not experience serious anxiety or stress associated with the difference between their gender identity and their gender of birth, and so may not have gender dysphoria. So it is reinforced that dysphoria is a diagnosis, whereas transness is an identity, meaning they are two separate things and can be discussed absent of each other. There are folks who can feel dysphoric but do not want to identify as trans, and there are trans folks who do not experience debilitating anxiety and thus find it unnecessary to claim they have dysphoria. But perhaps this national organization isn't enough for you. Let's explore instead what Planned Parenthood has noted on the matter. In defining dysphoria, Planned Parenthood writes, gender dysphoria is a term that psychologists and doctors use to describe the distress, unhappiness, and anxiety that transgender people may feel about the mismatch between their bodies and their gender identity. This quote says quite simply that one, trans folks may and thus also may not experience dysphoria and that too, it is a term for psychologists and doctors to use for diagnosis, not necessarily everyday people to have an opinion about. Let's try to sit with some anecdotes as a way to make these words more human. In this example, Jess is a trans identified woman who lives in poverty. Jess wears a wig, she was gifted, light makeup when she is fortunate enough to have makeup, and wears on rotation the same three dresses she owns as often as she can. Jess cannot afford her rent, let alone a doctor's diagnosis. Is she trans if she has never sought out a doctor's approval of her being trans? I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty oppressive if that's how it works. Let's try another anecdote. Joey, a closeted trans-identified woman, is doing pretty well in life. She's married, has children, has a loving family, decent job. When she was younger, her brother, a gay man, was kicked out of his home and he soon after took his life. To this day, this scares Joey so much that she only wears women's clothing when she's on business trips for work or is lying about business trips for work. Joey fears seeking therapy or a proper diagnosis would out her and she would be ostracized by her family and lose everything. Joey, for this reason, never seeks a diagnosis. Is she trans? What I'm trying to get at here is that telling trans folks that they must absolutely be diagnosed with dysphoria 
purposefully puts a barrier of access in between their identity being taken seriously and an expensive doctor's visit. Maybe even one that could potentially out the individual producing a hostile environment. Furthermore, we are essentially saying we must ask for permission to identify as trans, which enforces an oppressive reality that says that any individual cannot identify in any way they choose, but that they must be granted permission to be who they are. When folks express the idea that the diagnosis is an absolute must, they are often referred to as trans medicalist. These folks are unable or unwilling to separate trans identity and the medical field's diagnosis process of dysphoria. This leads to elitism in those who were capable financially and socially to seek transition without being ostracized or worse. This kind of imposition required of trans lives leads us to believing that we are mentally ill, that we are not going to be treated as a human being by doctors, and that any notion of transition will lead to a social isolation because you have a condition. It is dangerous, and there is so much history showing that it has led to the stigmatization of the trans community as a whole, which of course leads to self-harm, isolation, and unfortunately, yes, also suicide. This is a rampant public health concern, and we see it more clearly when we consider the individual and how popular folks in any given media often demonize and publicly call out trans folks, which leads to violence. If it is not that, it is purposely hiding the true gender identity of trans victims as a way to cover up that violence against trans folks is a real thing. This is hard hitting and I do not want to end this video in such a harsh note. So here's a message for trans folks who are watching this video. Hi, <laughs> hello. <laughs> you are valid in your identity. It does not matter if you are questioning, if you are uncertain, if you enjoy some parts about your identity but are scared of exploring others. It is okay to feel different than others, even from other trans folks. Where you are in your life and your identity is a special moment because the present is always the most important and the most magical. Even if you are struggling, even if you are suffering, knowing who you are and taking control of who you feel you most desire to be can never be taken away. Your humanity can never be taken away. If anyone opposes you, strip them from your life. Our lives are too short to spend pleasing your employer, your parents, or your current partner. There is community out there, community that will love you, that will embrace you, that will give you opportunity. Seek them out. They are waiting for you. Please do note that you should think considerably before making radical decisions because you must, especially in our current climate, you must consider your safety and your ability to live. But there is something very powerful about humans that keep us going, that help us to keep standing back up when we've been knocked down. And we all have access to that. Meditate on your strengths and also on your wit and your intuition and let your community be your guide. I love you dearly, Angel, and I hope to speak with you again sometime soon, but until next time, stay strong, be well, and live your life for you. Bye-bye. <laughs>